Wonderful, Mary Carr, is it a go? It is a go. Great, well, welcome everyone. Uh, we are so pleased you could join us on behalf of the Yellow Club of Fort Worth. I'd like to extend a really, really warm welcome to you. Uh, this is a very special event for the club and we couldn't be more pleased uh, that you are joining us. This event will be recorded and so if um, your friends were not able to attend today, please do let them know that they will be able to watch the recording on our website. Now, um, uh, today uh, I would like to remind you before we go on to the uh, proper of our event that uh, the Yale Club of Fort Worth will have a, uh, annual, an annual meeting on October the 6th. Uh, an email has been sent out to all members. If you have not received the email, please do check with us uh, or check your um, uh, junk folder. Uh, it should be in your email. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, first uh, thank uh, Bob Bonds. Uh, this event could not uh, happen without his uh, incredible help. Uh, Bob Bonds is uh, the club's liaison at Yale Alumni Association. Thank you so much, Bob. For your help and also i uh, would like to introduce uh, your host for today uh, his name is declan kunkel and he uh, currently serves as the treasurer of the yale club of fort worth declan is a graduate uh, of 2019 of yale college uh, and his major was history and so declan on to you Thank you, Jesus, and thank you again to Professor Kennedy for uh, joining the Yale Club of Fort Worth today. We're really excited to have you and, and look forward to talking about your book. Um, for those of you on the call, I, I actually took Professor Kennedy's class on military history of the West since 1500, which was a wonderful course, and so it's great to be able to reconnect with him and uh, share a little bit about the class with you all today. But uh, Professor Kennedy, I thought we'd just start off broad and then work our way in and, and talk a little bit about, uh, to start, what inspired you to write the uh, the rise and fall of great powers? What 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 was uh, the impetus behind you writing it, and, and what uh, in the world uh, did you see as key issues that needed to be addressed? Uh, thank you, Declan. And let me say immediately, I'm so thrilled to be here with you all this afternoon. Uh, thank you for uh, tuning in, uh, and uh, thank Marika and. Uh, and Jesus for the uh, arrangements for this, uh, and and Bob Bonds as well, to helping out from from this side. Um, how do uh, how do historians, how do authors, nonfiction authors get uh, ideas for a a book? It doesn't just come out of nowhere, as you're guessing with that question, Declan. It comes out. It must come out of somewhere. What was the stimulus? How far back had the idea of this book been going on in um, a historian's mind? Uh, how far had uh, the great uh, French historian Fernand Brodel been thinking about his wonderful classic work on the Mediterranean in the age of Philip II, just because he was a school teacher on the side of a Mediterranean in Algiers and thought of, had a conception of how to write about the whole uh, sea and its history. Uh, the, the, the stimulus for the rise and fall of great powers came actually, Declan, out of, uh, if you like, the rear end of another book which I had written as a rather young uh, scholar when I was at the University of East Anglia in uh, Norfolk. Uh, shortly after I uh, graduated with my PhD from, from Oxford. And uh, I was uh, persuaded by a uh, publisher at Penguin, uh, Alan Lane in London, to think of uh, a book on naval history, which I proposed to him, Peter Carson, as not just being a narrative of great naval fights and admirals and Nelson and uh, Jellico and others, but did you not have a theme about your Naval History of England book? And that's when I told him I really would be interested in trying to write a long arching, bold book for a young scholar, story of uh, Great Britain's 
relative rise and fall over the four centuries from the first Queen Elizabeth to the second Queen Elizabeth, looking at that naval and imperial rise and fall and connecting it with the four centuries of Britain's great rise as a commercial trading financial country and, um, and then an industrial country and then uh, the, the steady erosion and fall of Great Britain uh, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And so um, uh, he gave me a contract, told me to go off and write it, and I, I scribbled away as any young scholar does, keen to get you know, recognition, keen to get, uh, keen to make your impress on the world. And I really was, uh, you know, transfixed and enchanted by my theme. And so within a couple of years, Declan, I had written a book which came out in 1976 called The Rise and Fall of British Naval Mastery. Um, it, 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 did, it did me an awful lot of good. Let's, let's be candid about how scholars get promotion and things like that. It made my name. It was the first long sweep history of British naval policy since, since Richmond back in the 1920s. And it's never been out of print. And it went into various foreign translations and re-editions and once with fresh forwards after the uh, Falklands War. After 9-11, I was asked to write a further forward to it. But I do recall that uh, at the very end of, of this manuscript of Rise and Fall of, a great, of British Naval Mastery, I found a wonderful quotation from a British 18th century commentator um, uh, looking out from the self-confident number one Britain beginning to bestride the world after winning the Seven Years' War. And, um, the, the commentator Thompson said, look at poor old Spain. <laughs> 250 years ago, 200 years ago, uh, Spain was the number one country in the world, a great naval country. We were the small nation, and now there it is with its empire scattered and it's running out of funds and in a rather poor condition. And of course, it was ironic that the 18th century British commentator would look back at Spain and say, oh my goodness, they've had their rise and fall. <laughs> Professor Kennedy, did we lose you? Declan, I'm going to call him real quick. Thank you very much. Looks like we are having a few technical difficulties. If you give us just one moment, we'll try to get Professor Kennedy back on the line. I realized uh, as we're waiting that we might not have had the opportunity to uh, properly introduce Paul Kennedy. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Professor Kennedy is currently the J. Richardson Dilworth Professor of History at Yale and is the Director of International Security Studies as well as a Distinguished Fellow of the Brady Johnson Program in Grand Strategy. In that capacity, he coordinates security studies programs and is known for his writing and, uh, and commentaries on global political, economic, and strategic issues. As, Uh, as you probably guessed from his accent, he uh, grew up in the north, north of England uh, in Walsand, Northumberland, and attained a BA from Newcastle and then a DPhil from Oxford. His book, Rise and Fall of Great Powers, came out in the early 19, uh, late 1980s and really predicted the fall of the Soviet Union and the rise of Eastern Asian powers before uh, discussing a potential relative decline. 
So that's a little bit of background to give you context when we have Professor Kennedy back on. Uh, Mari Card, you have, uh, oh, it looks like he just joined. Professor Kennedy, uh, do we have you back? You do have me back. You're back. You're back, Professor Kennedy. Ah, there was a rise and fall of Professor Kennedy. I apologize <laughs> for that. And it was just, uh, I, I, I feel like blaming the dog who's wandering around here, but I think it was <laughs> my fault in not connecting you. Um, Marika, thank you. So the, all I was going to say was that, that it struck me as I sent off the manuscript to a uh, penguin of, of a rise and fall of British naval mastery, that if that British commentator could talk about poor old Spain back then with its empire shrunken and its finances badly hit, then wasn't it the case, this was Paul Kennedy in the... Uh, in the shrunken uh, Great Britain in his troubled time in the 1970s, um, couldn't uh, an American commentator look at uh, the story of Great Britain and shake, shake uh, his head at Britain's great story of rise and fall and now it had diminished itself. Um, why couldn't one do a more general survey of the rise and fall of great powers in the modern times, Declan. Now, I had other books to do in the 1970s, and so I just had that idea in the back of my mind until um, I, around about 1980, I started scribbling. And I started scribbling hard on this idea of rise and fall of, of powers. And in the middle of that, in 1983, um, I uh, came over to Yale. I was, you might call, a, a, a Mrs. Thatcher export. I was not enjoying being a, a, a young chairman of a history department in a time when the Thatcher administration was cutting back on uh, government funding for universities and research. And uh, Yale had offered me this new chair that J. Richard Dilworth Professorship of essentially British Imperial and International History. And I came across with my family of three boys, my wife, and uh, half a manuscript. And uh, it was a, when I set up teaching at Yale and started teaching with the likes of people like Professors Donald Kagan and Gaddis Smith and others, I resumed work on the chapters of this new book, which was boldly called The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers uh, from 1500 to the present. Actually, I did mean it, the present to be 1945, when in the British view of things, everything came to a full stop and history ended because Churchill's Britain was no longer top. But uh, as I was writing the book in the 1984, 85, 86, one could see this great tension between uh, the, the declining Soviet and troubled Soviet Union on the one hand and the, uh, the administration of President Reagan on the other, battered in many ways by very, very large federal deficits and trade deficits, a, a not very good economy, even though um, the US government was spending a great, great deal upon defense budget, it was weak at the bottom. And so I decided rather rashly, uh, Declan, to write an additional chapter eight, which was, the great powers in their present situation and into the future. And it was, of course, that venture by this historian to say a little about where he thought the Soviet Union was going, the United States was going, a budding European Union was going, uh, the rising People's Republic of China was going, and the very successful Japan. 
And when the book came out at the beginning of 1988, uh, what did the reviewers do in the popular press like Time magazine and we, uh, Newsweek? They featured only on the last chapter of this enormous big book, and they only wanted to discuss really whether the United States was in decline or not. And that coincided with the 1988 presidential election and the debate upon the eight years of the Reagan administration. It got swirled up into a great controversy for month after month after month. It meant the book sold like crazy. Uh, and a number of reviewers were fair enough to look at the New York Times book review, spent three pages on it, were fair enough to look at the whole book itself, but others just wanted to talk about the Kennedy thesis or the decline thesis. Some of you listening in now were uh, probably old enough to go out and get a hard copy of the original. This is what the thing looks like. Uh, the rise and fall of the great powers, economic change and military conflict from 1500 to 2000. And there it was 12 years before the end of the century, but um, it just hit the bestseller lists. And it took me the whole year or more to deal with press, publicity, guest lectures, foreign travel, uh, defending myself, <laughs> before I kind of settled back down to being a Yale professor. So the origins of it were a smaller book then an idea for a bigger book then sitting down to write the bigger book and then having the final part of a bigger book turned into something else. Let me stop there. Declan, please unmute. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the reminder. Um, Professor Kenny, thank you for that answer and, and for going uh, into such detail about uh, how the book came to be. As, as you mentioned, one of the key critiques of the book is that it talked about history um, and, and a cyclical decline. And something that we hear a lot uh, in the news these days is that uh, the U.S. might be in a relative decline to China or to uh, Asian powers. And so I noticed uh, that the book was recently translated into Mandarin. I was hoping you might comment a little bit about that. What do you think it means uh, that the book has now uh, found a home with Chinese audiences? Uh, it certainly has, Declan. And uh, as a caution to what I'm going to say, it's, it, I have to remind myself that when the book first came out, it was the Japanese who thought that they had been fingered and uh, and been identified by Professor Kennedy as the country which would be the next number one. The Japanese had got very excited by a book by a Harvard professor, Ezra Fogel, called uh, Japan as number one. And now here was this great Yale historian coming along and the, uh, the, the uh, little motif illustration on the front of a rise and fall of the great powers showed a little you may not be able to see this, but it's a sort of medieval wheel of fortune figures here. And the figure declining already is Great Britain. John Bull at the top, a tentative. Uncle Sam is taking a step off and rising up. And just to make sure you see who it is with the rising sun flag is Japan. So the sales in Japan were even greater Declan and the sales in the United States uh, in the translation of it. Uh, it was quite, quite, quite remarkable. So the cynic uh, among this audience, and I'm sure there are many well-traveled former diplomats and businessmen who would say this, the cynic in this audience would say, um, if you get a book about the rise and fall of the great powers, which is sort of pinpointing where a country might be and whether it might be in decline or rising, uh, you can be sure that it's gonna get a lot more attention if it thinks it's rising. 
There was originally and shortly after the uh, great controversy in the US and many foreign language uh, translations and publications of it, there was a um, uh, unauthorized, a whole number of unauthorized Chinese translations, uh, which drove my literary agent nuts because we got no royalties from them. They just sold and sold without our being able to control them. But after China joined the International Copyright Convention, it also wanted to have a legitimate uh, single translation and, uh, and edition of it. It has come out in Mandarin a number of times previously, Declan. The most recent one, if I'm, Professor Kennedy is in the, now in the habit of showing uh, book titles to the uh, Club of Fort Worth. The most recent one, well, I went down to my basement where I keep a whole lot of the uh, complimentary copies on the back shelves there. I went to my basement to find the Mandarin, latest Mandarin edition of a Chinese edition translation of the rise and fall of the great powers. And if you look at it, you'd think this doesn't look like Professor Kennedy's original book. It looks like some sort of Star Wars, zoom, bang, futuristic space combat illustration. And so it is. So the, the title is there, all right, the rise and fall of the great powers. Um, but as you can see, it has diving F-16 fighters. It has uh, surface-to-air missiles. It has uh, sinister-looking uh, sort of American special forces up in the top here. And so you have to ask yourself, what did the Chinese publisher think that he was doing in presenting this to the Chinese audience, this new Mandarin translation. It, it, why is it now Declan uh, recording when the figures come in via my London literary agent? Why are the sales in China of Professor Kennedy's rise and fall of the great powers larger than the sales in any of the other foreign language markets and larger than the sales in this country? Why? Is it now China which is interested in the story of the rise and fall of great powers? Thank you very much. I certainly appreciate that. Uh, something that was interesting in, in preparing for the talk and rereading the book, um, I, I was really struck by what, what might be a faulty comparison on my part between the Habsburg uh, bid for uh, mastery that you talk about. In 1519 to 1659, and, and the Chinese model, where you see large, um, large militaries run by uh, monarchs and bureaucracies that tend to be uh, led by an individual at the top with not great information flow. Do you think that that is a point that lands uh, with the Chinese readership? Well, if they do, they would uh, be cautious and shake their heads. The story of the gigantic. Uh, sprawling, multi-linguistic, multi-ethnic uh, Habsburg Empire, which definitely was number one Spanish and Austrian Habsburgs for maybe uh, 150 years or so of European history, might be seen as maybe a, a forerunner of the number one great power that the Chinese would like to talk about, but also might be seen Declan as a kind of cautionary tale. Um, what do you do when you have just a single uh, office, a single person at the top, all of the others are deferential to that person, uh, a, 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 not, a, not so much a single nation, but a large multi-ethnic body, uh, despite the Chinese desire that everything is, you know, Mandarin uh, and Manchu. In fact, it's, uh, it, it is clearly a, a, a larger uh, empire with all sorts of uh, ethnic and linguistic fringes to it. 
uh, it's spending increasingly amount, increasing amounts on its Air Force, Navy, and high tech. Um, and it may be starting to overheat in that dimension. So, yes, you're right. You can go and look at some of these other examples of a long standing and increasingly conservative, cautious uh, Habsburg Empire and say, uh, could there be lessons for China? The single rule at the top is that really effective at the end of the day compared with the cabinet system or an electoral system? And uh, could we be forced to spend on armed forces for different directions and for different enemies? Thank you, Professor Kennedy. I have two more questions and then we'll turn it over to the larger body. Uh, the, the first question um, is uh, talking a little bit about something that, that also made headlines. Uh, obviously, Rise and Fall of Great Powers was, was one of those books uh, that appeared on Osama bin Laden's bookshelf in, in the compound. And I'd love to learn a little bit more about uh, how you reacted to that and, and why you think that um, that was. Why I reacted to the comments? Yes, or particularly how the, um, uh, the event that your book was found in the uh, Bin Laden compound uh, influenced your thinking about the book. Um, just to put in uh, the word decline <laughs> and the United States of America, or American decline or US decline in the world causes immediate knee jerk reactions of different sorts uh, across different parts of the globe. Um, the outer cover of the rise and fall of great powers had at the back end a um, a extract from uh, something near the end, like page 534, an extract about how the United States, even if it's at the top, is facing the long-standing challenge of whether it's in a state of imperial overstretch, whether, whether it might be coming into relative decline, and isn't a challenge for American policymakers to manage that relative decline as carefully and uh, prudentially as possible. When uh, American conservatives, especially those trying to defend the large spending of the Reagan administration, saw the attention that Professor Kennedy's Rise and Fall book was getting, they lashed out against it. Uh, they lambasted Professor Kennedy as a professor of decline, decline as school. The Wall Street Journal has spent 30 years against that. And um, the more they did that, the more tension uh, was caused and the more the book sold to the delight of my great editor at Random House, Jason Epstein. But to, uh, to other folks, to people outside the United States, there was this interest in is, and especially those who resent the American presence, who resent the American footprint in different parts of the globe, there's a great interest in American decline. And they're curious. And so um, various Arab newspapers from time to time try and come and ask if they can do an interview with me or a radio talk show interview. And one of the most popular questions which they ask is, Professor Kennedy, when will the United States be finished? When will the decline have been total? Uh, when is it going to happen, Professor Kennedy? We're reading your big book, but we can't see. We, we, we're very hopeful about American decline, but when is it going to happen? And so my head spins at this, and I realize that they are wanting, you know, kind of rejoicing at the notion that there is something inevitable about this. And this is a big question for 
maybe people to consider and toss questions in about, is there anything inevitable in history, even when we look at the long term? So you've got those who dislike decline argument because they want America to be standing tall, and some people outside who like the idea of decline. Thank you very much, Professor Kennedy. And, and uh, before we move on to audience questions, the last question I had for you is uh, what you're up to now? What does grand strategic thinking look like at Yale in the time of coronavirus? And, and what are you working on these days? I should say for all those who uh, you know, uh, are keen to get news from Yale and wondering what's happening on the campus, uh, it has returned to teaching and courses very gingerly and very carefully uh, three weeks ago. Uh, we have allowed to return to campus um, Yale seniors and Yale juniors and freshmen for the first year, uh, for the first semester, I beg your pardon. Uh, sophomores are at home doing Zoom distance classes with us uh, and they will come if they wish to and uh, be here in the second semester while the uh, freshmen will take a rest back home. You don't have to be at campus and, and you can come to New Haven uh, like many seniors do and you can find apartments down the street and you can be inside of Yale and maybe come to some Yale events uh, but take most of your classes again online. Um, so the faculty uh, had to, in a rather disruptive way, try to do Zoom teaching in the middle of last semester. Now we are doing it uh, rather better organized and with support from the Yale facilities. Almost all of us are teaching undergraduate classes uh, online, um, graduate seminars and professional seminars. That's different. They may have more room, more space. Um, and so they will be able to teach in a different way. Uh, we are conscious that there might be a you know, second wave and that the university might have to change things, but knock on wood, so far, so good. Uh, in the course of this, of course, we haven't been able to teach our grand strategy seminar in the normal way we would. Uh, Professor Beverly Gage and uh, Mike Brenners, the Associate Director of Brady Johnson Program, are teaching Grand Strategy uh, in their class, uh, but they're teaching it with the, with the guest speakers and everything else like that at a distance. We, we have to. Um, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful um, question you posed at the very end, Declan, and I think I'm going to uh, say very little about it in my answer now because other people might wish to raise a variant question. Uh, how do you uh, bring in a new element like COVID-19 to a study of, of strategy, of, of policy? Is it just an outside freak uh, biological pandemic event which will come and go like the uh, you know, the flu virus of, of 1918, 1919? Or is it something more significant, uh, which will have a lasting effect, like say, the Russian Revolution of 1917? And how do we teach it to the class? Uh, I think uh, if people are able to look at the syllabus, they'll see attempts to incorporate that. It is a reminder that you cannot at any year actually know what it is which will be the big concern of the policymakers in 12 months' time. A sobering lesson to us all, Dave Glass. Thank you for that last question. Thank you. And so turning it over to the audience Q&A, the, the first question uh, is from Pat Carter on climate change. Um, she says, how do you think climate change will strategically impact the current great powers, particularly economic impact, and that the U.S. is less like is, is less invested in climate change than the EU and perhaps China. So there's another question of these, Pat, what I would call a transnational forces for change, which are different from the traditional way of thinking of great powers or nation states or 
or arms races. Um, and yet, you know, if you, if you start to list what are the transnational forces for uh, instability and causing insecurity in the largest sense of what security is, we would, we would start to say, well, a financial breakdown, a collapse of the world markets would be something that would have ripple effects upon each of the great powers, depending upon how well or how badly they were able to respond to that. Massive population migrations would be another transnational turbulence that some countries can handle better or more ruthlessly or more easily than others. Um, uh, COVID-19 is something which was not on our radar screens nine months ago and it now is in every item of the newspaper. It's hard to find an item and say the big New York Times where it isn't COVID related. And, um, and, and yet, of course, we all know that uh, maybe at just the beginning of this year or a year ago, uh, people would say it is the increasing evidence of the uh, of the warming of the atmosphere, the warming of the oceans and the turbulences which are occurring in different parts of the world, climate change, which is a big long-term challenge. In fact, we have now seen, I'm sure you've picked up comments by a particular people from the Prince of Wales to, you know, to UN agencies saying that COVID is something that we will get over with, but the climate change is a big one. Uh, if that's so, uh, then you're fair to ask the question, how well prepared is the United States as compared with certain other, the large players in the world, the European Union, uh, China, Japan, uh, to deal with the multiple effects and challenges of climate change. Uh, it's really, uh, it would be silly to answer that just in a simple, we're better than anybody else, uh, knee-jerk reaction, or to say we are really in a hopeless condition. We don't, we don't have the agencies empowered as, uh, professionally and strongly and funded as strongly as say the Scandinavians or the Canadians right now. And we maybe have such a large, sprawling and vulnerable continent. We used to think their clan of this continent of the United States as being invulnerable to foreign invasion because we had 6,000 miles of the Pacific Ocean on one side and 3,000 miles of the Atlantic on the other side. But what if the invasion that comes, this is behind this question, what if the invasion which comes is not foreign landing amphibious forces, what if the invasion that comes is a steady upward creep of climate heating so that the whole southern swathe of the United States, including, I'm sorry to say, Fort Worth, <laughs> is going to be drier and drier and drier and the, the water shortages and the pressure upon the crops there and all the way up to the Midwest will be severe. What if the storm systems are gonna be heavier along the coasts of the Eastern Atlantic because the uh, hurricanes and the, the tornadoes are gonna be stronger there than anything which happens in say Central Europe? So in that case, what should this nation prudently be doing now? A, to work with others to see if we can head off some of the broader transnational pressures from our damage to the climate. And secondly, what can we do in particular for the United States agencies and parts of the United States to handle climate change? We don't look particularly strong at the moment, even if we have 11 very powerful aircraft carrier groups in the Pacific and in the Atlantic. Thank you, Professor Kennedy. The next question uh, comes from Kiskata Hastings, uh, who says uh, that uh, I, was, I was interested when you were talking about how Japan at one point also used your book as an idea uh, 
of what their future role, of what their role would be in the future. And I wonder, uh, what do you feel like would happen in order to take claims of China's rise to power more seriously? This is a question uh, I, I get more than any other. That is to say, uh, if, if it turned out that the, uh, the Russian Soviet threat to the United States and the possibility that Moscow might become the you know, world leader was simply eroded by its overspending and its poor economic performance, uh, what are we to think of this different country, this newer country, this uh, looks like much more competent, fiscally strong, more balanced and purposeful China. Could we be talking about a China as number one? Could we be talking about a China as uh, replacing the United States over the next uh, decade or so if its total GDP hasn't already caught up to ours now. Anybody who takes, uh, Declan, you may do this, I don't know, but anybody uh, among a bunch of those listening in now, anybody who takes, subscribes to the weekly uh, London-based journal, The Economist, <laughs> and uh, goes back to look at the front covers of The Economist, all through last year and well into the beginning of this year, would be struck by how many times The Economist somehow has had China on the front cover. Often as a Chinese dragon, often as a, some sort of lurid cartoon about China, uh, China-America antagonism, head to head, the great Pacific Ocean confrontation, and yet the question, the question that came, the wonderful question is, well, mightn't China's rise and the purported Chinese threat that we're fixated about in many uh, organs of the press and the media, Declan, mightn't that fade, have faded away in 10 years time, just as the Japan as number one threat faded away as Japan's economy uh, stopped growing and in fact just stagnated all through the 1990s and the 2000s. So what do we see in China that might suggest it's not 20 foot tall, but it has all sorts of uh, its own weaknesses, its domestic problems, its internal challenges, and uh, if we put China in the story of the rise and fall of the great powers, how careful should we be about flagging it as the predictable, likely, inevitable number one? Lots of people will be thinking about that. Thank you very much, Professor. Ne ne the next question we have from the audience is from David Robinson, who writes, if you were writing the book today, what would your description of the U.S. and its possible overstretch uh, be different? I'm sorry, would your description of the U.S. and its possible overstretch be different? What a very key and uh, central and, and fixed question. Thank you for that. I, I should say, and I didn't have time to say in the beginning, Declan, that uh, having just finished a, a, a large book on the Second World War and the shift in the global naval power balances uh, and sent it off to Yale University Press for you know, production and final uh, work on it, uh, I will be turning at the end of this year and early next year at last, after many years, to going back to try to do a second edition of the rise and fall of the great powers. Um, I thought of doing it uh, some years ago when it was at its, believe it or not, at its 25th anniversary of the rise and fall of the great powers. Um, but I was distracted by this other book challenge and, um, and, and so I decided to postpone it. And the interesting thing is, and here is a, uh, 
here's a caution to all of us who are thinking about doing second editions or defending oneself and over what you wrote some years ago, is that we are all bound by our contemporary thoughts that kind of, we're all, all sort of the children of the exact age and time where almost what we saw in the latest Wall Street Journal um, is, in, is uh, an influencing us about the way we think about the world. And in regard to this story of where the United States is relative to the other great powers in the world, then I am so grateful that the language that I tried to use in the final paragraphs, the final pages of Rise and Fall of the Great Powers were relatively cautionary and careful. And I wasn't saying there's something is going to happen to the United States. It's going to be knocked off the top by Russia in 15 years time. I can't predict that. But because uh, different powers have different, in a long-term stretch of things, an a enormous great power like the United States can uh, have a bad decade or so, and then uh, have a, a turnaround in its uh, balance of payments. It can have a turnaround in the leadership at the top. It can find that while it is struggling and finding it rather hard to keep up uh, competitively, economically, as Mr. Reagan's government was, nonetheless, it looks rather good when the Soviet Union collapses. What happens if, you know, what would happen if we woke up, uh, Declan, to a newspaper reports that there were enormous, broad, broad, dispersed uh, economic and social unrest and peasants' riots and a great civil war happening in Western and Southern China, which was spreading across China like wildfire, and China was starting to have to turn inside and begin to tumble down as a great power and have, like those Habsburgs of yours, to deal with all of its internal problems and challenges and couldn't have time to be bestriding the world straight stage. And therefore, relatively speaking, again, I talk about relative measures of, of power and influence. Relatively speaking, the US gets a breathing space it gets a better chance so uh, the, uh, edmund burke uh, the great late 18th century english philosopher said that there's a, an awful lot of staying in a great nation there's an awful lot of duration there's an awful lot of stamina in a great nation so yes we can look at some uh, indicators which would suggest that when professor kennedy does this second edition of a rise and fall of a great powers, I'd be pointing to indicators of the way in which the US relative share of markets, relative share of world currencies, a relative share of total world GDP, maybe now a little bit further down and forecast to go a bit further if Asian economies grow faster than ours. But there's a long time and a long duration in a nation. And I kind of fancy that the language I'll be using in the last few paragraphs of the second edition, Declan will be pretty cautious about the world in the crazy 21st century we're living in. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, the, the next question comes from uh, Gary Klinger, who, who asked about how, how does one write a book that is as highly detailed and has 500,000 or more words like the rise and fall of, of great powers? What is the writing process like? Do you have to work 20 hours a day, have a photographic memory? How do you keep track of all the numbers and statistics and facts? Uh, well, well, first of all, thank you for saying that. <laughs> Secondly, I will assure this audience, especially those who might be you know, maybe uh, around my age or close to it, that I certainly couldn't do it again. Uh, a, a major big work like that 
yeah, maybe a mature scholar can do it uh, over quite a number of years of time and then bring it to fruition. But if, it, if it's a really big book demanding an awful lot of reading, checking, energy, especially energy, that gets to my questioner's point about 20 hours a day. Um, I, I really think you have to be a, a younger scholar. I, I really think you need, uh, because you're trying to deal with all of the other things in life, your, your family, your obligations, your professional job, uh, unless you are a pure, you know, self-standing, alone, funded scholar, you have to trade off time and obligations in which to do it. Uh, so I think it's probably, if you're going to do a really big work, it's probably that's the one of a, of a, 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 a female or male scholar, probably in their early 40s, as I was, rather than quite a bit older. And if you're quite a bit younger than that, you probably are daunted by the idea and you're trying to get through grad school. So your window of opportunity, as it were, is probably where you are as a, a fairly young but established scholar moving from your second or third book to a, a bigger work and saying, can I do it? And then organizing yourself. And here I think uh, it, it's also fair to say that it would be hard to do, Teclan, if, if you were weighed down by some of the conditions which afflict um, professors at the less well-off schools and colleges up and down this country. Thank you very um, much. Oh, go ahead. I'm going to say, you know, it's it, Yale professors. I'm sure many of you know this. Every every uh, third year, the the dean, the dean of the faculty gives those who have a project, who have a research project, gives them this semester off, the semester away from teaching, administration, committees, and you can go to wherever you want in the world and be there and writing. And it took me, like, as I time it, three of those six months semesters off, as well as writing late at night to get that big book done. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, the next question we have, comes from Courtney Carroll. And, and, and Courtney Carroll asks if you can discern a grand strategy of current American State Department initiatives. Is there a grand strategy that you can see? Specifically to the US State Department, its role as the premier knowledgeable advising agency to the president has been much diminished in the past few decades, not just with this president, but in the past few decades, because of a presidential desire to do uh, one's own personal diplomacy, reaching out to foreign leaders, uh, taking initiatives, uh, making declarations about foreign policy without formally consulting the State Department. If you do not replace an array of our most competent ambassadors who've retired and left open the embassies and consulates and, and ministries in various parts of the globe, then uh, that doesn't matter if you're not going to pay much attention to the State Department in any case. So maybe in the State Department, the classic policy planning staff, which was uh, set up there under the great George Kennan after the Second World War, maybe there's still a shrunken shell of that policy planning staff, maybe under a new 
presidential leadership, there would be a far greater attention paid to what our professional foreign service and our ambassadors say about how we deal with Latin American issues, with Middle East issues, with trade diplomacy issues. But right now, it'd be hard to say that there's any chance that the uh, State Department itself can play much of a role in formulating anything like an American strategy. It can be asked to do things. It can be asked to accompany members of the White House family as they go to different parts of the world, but not an effective central advising role as was seen by uh, foreign secretaries and um, and the foreign office it's, uh, and the State Department itself for many years in the past. Professor Kennedy, um, I think Jonathan Rose would like to ask a question. I'm going to allow him to talk. Go ahead, Jonathan. Go ahead and unmute. Unmute, Jonathan. Well, I actually didn't have my hand up, but uh, I, I am interested in the uh, China issue. Do you think there's anything to this notion that the current aggressiveness of uh, Xi is tied to his perception that uh, the aging state of uh, the Chinese population is going to require a significant diversion of resources in, say, a decade or so, so that he better uh, get whatever China can while it can? So it's clear when one looks at the demographic profile of China and the uh, longer term impacts, of course, of the one child per family policy of previous decades and the uh, preference of Chinese young people now to marry later unless they are countryside peasants and um, a number of other uh, socioeconomic motives and reasons um, that the Chinese population is uh, overall an aging population. That doesn't by any means uh, mean that it has the uh, very elderly profile of certain uh, parts of the Western former Soviet Union uh, or of Japan itself but it is clear that it's going to be carrying the burden of hundreds of millions of, of Chinese nationals who are over the age of 65, over the age of 75, and that will indeed be a drain upon national resources. There may also be a certain amount, uh, Jonathan, a certain amount of a drain upon national energy, maybe a, a more cautious, inward-looking, populous when uh, there is a new administration, new leadership there. So isn't this a time for China to be more on the assertive side and more, as you say, getting what it needs now before uh, it, it feels the, the burdens of old age and the need to spend on a changed demographic profile? That's maybe uh, the China watchers uh, scratch their heads about that. I would say, and here's a thought for you uh, who've thought about this a lot, I would say that whenever we in the West talk about this or that weakness or perceived weakness of China, the Chinese kind of listen to that and then go back and try to mend it and try to fix it. If we say, well, you know, their particular warships aren't as very good because they have diesel engines rather than turbine engines, they'll go back and try to sort that out. In a few years' time, you'll find that they've got the improved engines in. In the same way, I think, uh, even in socioeconomic criticisms, they may be thinking, well, how do we successfully maintain a great power a really great power position, even if we have an aging population. And it would, it, it's quite possible that they are listening to another strand of Chinese thought, uh, 
which is actually the future is on our side. Don't push it right now. Don't be so aggressive. Here's a thought for everybody listening in. If, it's a big if, and some economists would dispute it, but if over the next 20 or 25 years, the US economy grew on average at a rate of 2.5% each year, 3%, that's the sort of growth rate of a mature economy. If we did that, and if the Chinese economy grew at a, on average, with lots of ups and downs, but on average at a, a overall rate of 5% a year, then it would simply be a lot richer than we because of this relative rates of growth are different and beneficial to China. In that circumstance, Jonathan, China might be rich enough to pay for all of its old age pensions and still pay for a rising big fleet of new aircraft carriers. With a lot of money, you can pay for a lot of things, guns and butter. Thank you, Professor. We have one more write-in question from Tyler Godoff, who uh, writes that the 1619 project at the New York Times seems to be indicative of the United States' current challenge to agree on what constitutes an accurate account of U.S. history. What do you think are the implications when a nation fails to embrace a shared narrative? Well, your commentator is right, your question is right about failing to engage a shared narrative. You know, regardless of what your own political and ideological position is right now, I think you'd have to agree that that position is, 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 seems to be either on one side of a, of a divide and a national narrative and a cultural view of the United States, which is not shared by the other half of the nation. Uh, it, it's, to me, uh, as a you know, professional follower of international affairs, Declan, among other things I do each day, is to sit down with the New York Times, I mean, the, the real print edition of the New York Times, on one side of my, my breakfast table in the kitchen, and the Wall Street Journal on the other side. I also read the Financial Times and other ones, but the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times almost encapsulate this failure to have a joint narrative. Because the Wall Street Journal's comments on the idea that uh, there was something about 1619 which uh, uh, scarred the entire nation in a history of slavery. And that was a, a, the fundamental founding narrative of the country was not so much uh, the arrival of the 20 years earlier of um, the Mayflower pilgrims and anything else like that. It was the arrival of the slaves. That itself uh, picked up now and given such wide press, but derided and attacked from the other side of the cultural intellectual spectrum speaks to the fact that we have an extremely divided political nation at this time. And uh, I think that this a 1619 narrative or a focus on 1619 or an attack upon the 1619 symbol story is characteristic. If it hadn't been 1619, I would bet it would be something else in the, sh in the narrative of the United States, which the one side of a political ideological spectrum favored and the other side did not favor. Terrific. Thank you, Professor Kennedy. Those were all the questions from the participants, but I'll issue one final call. If you have any questions for Professor Kennedy, please go ahead and write them or raise your hand. Mari Carr, it looks like we have someone who's raised their hand. Would you be able to unmute them? Uh, Robert Simon, I'm going to allow you to talk. Please unmute. 
Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kennedy. It's a great pleasure to talk to you. Um, Professor Kennedy. Bob, Bob, can I see you as well? I can hear you fine. Um, I don't know if my camera is working. Oh, okay. Never mind. And we, I can hear you. And I, I can see you. Um, Professor Kennedy, it seems to me that you can only be a great power as long as you want to be. And one of the things that seems so so remarkable, again, I, I graduated in 1986 and you know, grew up in the, in the 70s and I took, took a couple of your classes when I was at Yale. Um, but at that time, there was a consensus in America, pretty broad consensus, I mean, from, from you know, Ronald Reagan over to those of us who consider ourselves liberals, that we really wanted to be a great power, that the United States really wanted to be in a great power not in the sense of dominating the world, but engaging with the world and, and being influential in the world, um, you know, not necessarily by military power, you know, principally by diplomatic means and economic means, um, always with the, 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 you know, the military capability in the background, but not in the, in the, in the, in the, in the foreground of those efforts. Um, and at least if you look at the current administration, there is a very significant portion of the elites of America who simply don't want that, uh, at least are not willing to pay for it. Um, and do you have any idea why that may be? Well, first of all, uh, you're right to put your finger upon this issue of a personal inclination and disposition of the, of whoever the rulers are and whether they want large scale foreign responsibilities and a, a, a signs of an American preeminence world affairs or whether they want to pull back or disengage from the world as the saying goes. And uh, um, I think that you can only explain that by either the you know, political calculation of those who want to pull back or by a, a sense that uh, maybe the, they feel the nation is exhausted, maybe there's a need to turn in it is interesting to me that it has normally, uh, Bob, been a more liberal or left of center administration, which has said, whoa, we are carrying too many burdens out there. We don't want to take over from, say, the British Empire as, as a number one imperial power. We don't want to be imperial power at all. So it is the, uh, the Woodrow Wilson's trying to you know, get, get out of the great power entanglements after 1918. It is a succession of more liberal administrations, including the early years of FDR. And then it's also, again, with uh, President Jimmy Carter, the desire to downsize the military. A downsizing of the military takes place again under uh, Bill Clinton in the first few years, a great uh, pulling away from the expenditures in, on defense of the last Ronald Reagan years. So now we have, uh, interestingly, a president who I think you would agree could be called belligerent and aggressive in a personal sense, but also wanting to pull out of a goddamn world and uh, not be involved in this place or that place. In some cases, he's pulling out significantly, you would have to admit. What would happen if a, a new uh, administration or an administration after the next administration feels itself obligated to step forward again? What would happen if you have in 10 or 12 years time a um, existential future of Israel, crisis in the Middle East, together with a Chinese attempt to surround and move on uh, Taiwan. And the pressures just go uh, irresistibly domestically for the president and the administration to do things and to become a big overseas power once again. The question then, would Robert, would be not so much whether we want to, but you, because you may be forced by circumstance to do it, but whether we actually by then would have the economic strength, 
and the military sophistication and the sufficient amount of force projection to be able to be that number one big power in the world? And that's an open question too. Declan, back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Kennedy. It looks like we have a few hands raised. Marikar, if you'd uh, unmute I believe them. Jesus also wanted to have a question in. I'm not quite sure. Was that right, Marika? No, I think so. We're going to go with uh, Jonathan Rose. I think he has another question. Uh, your hand is raised, so I'm going to allow you to talk. And, and I'm going to give it to you. All right, then. Go ahead, Jonathan. Well, just following up on that uh, train of thought you were just on, I wonder, given the relative disinterest of the majority of the voters in uh, foreign policy generally, uh, and the economic strains were obviously uh, under in a lot of different directions from a lot of domestic demands. Uh, how much flexibility do you think a Biden administration has, or a putative Biden administration, let's put it that way, uh, would have in, in trying to reconstruct institutions such as the State Department um, in terms of uh, and foreign policy generally. Do you, do you think that can be a major focus or are we just too exhausted at this point to really spend a whole lot of time on it or do we need to? I mean, obviously we need to, but the question is, can we? I would think that if there is a change of administration uh, next year, there will be a, a significant attempt by the new administration before, while it's still fresh, and before it itself gets bonked on the head by God knows what new crisis comes along and affects it, to try to, they would say, repair uh, torn bonds, to reach out to resuscitate American uh, full membership of NATO, to return to the UN Security Council, to uh, make sure that they're part of the set of international organizations, or to show their uh, international credentials as opposed to the inward turn or isolationism of many of uh, President Trump's uh, declarations and policies and decisions. Um, then the question, and I think um, what you made you may be more skeptical, uh, Jonathan, than, than I. I think that they would find foreign leaders who would just be desperate to be re-engaged with the United States. You would find, I'm afraid Mrs. Merkel will be going soon, but you would find the successes of Mrs. Merkel up and down the world just wanting the United States to raise its hand and say, I wish to return to our international agency approaches to dealing with global issues. Whether though, and this is your question, whether the administration would have much more time than doing things like that like, and repairing the foreign service and making ambassadorial appointments and paying its dues into international agencies, whether it would have more time before it had to deal with its profound economic challenges and its internal domestic demands, it's difficult to say. I would think that they probably want to believe that the US can return to being a good neighbor internationally and be more committed internationally and get away with the internal repairs which they feel need to be done to the social fabric of the country. We shall see. We're not too far away from that. That's, that's, why don't I come back to this Fort Worth discussion uh, in five months time, Marika, and see what we said and what is already changed in the world by January or February of next year. Professor Kennedy, we would love for you to return in five months and talk about this. <laughs> well, why don't we make it seven months? Give, give whoever's the next president a chance to settle in. That's perfect. We have another hand raised from uh, Yale Club member Pat Carter. Uh, go ahead and unmute Pat. Uh, 
Okay, I think I've got it unmuted. So, Professor Kennedy, one thing that struck me in your book was that Spain lost a lot of its power because basically, even though they had all this money going coming in, it went out just as fast. So debt servicing kind of crushed them, if I read that correctly. Yes. And as I look at the U.S. now, I think that one thing that concerns me as an internal problem is the huge cumbersomeness of our medical system and the fact that it isn't very effective compared to other countries who spend much less. Also, that a lot of um, human energy is put into things like wrestling with your insurance company to make sure that your bills are paid reasonably. I mean, it just seems like that's a real productivity drain. And if you look at the way we measure GDP, huge amounts of that is for, um, for medical costs. And yet, relative to other countries, our medical costs are inflated. If we sort of took what people in UK or Switzerland or France pay for certain procedures and did our GDP by that, we wouldn't be ahead of China, I don't think. I mean, I, I don't want to do that math, but I'm concerned that that's an internal problem that will bring us down. And I wanted to know what you thought of that. Thank you for a very good question. Um, so it's, it's always interesting to me, Pat, to like peel away the uh, meaning of the larger macro statistic about the size of a nation's economy and say, well, yes, but when I look into it, it doesn't look as big or as promising or as flourishing or as healthy as I thought you. The, the Spanish GDP might be, it might have been in the year 1700 so large because Spain had a big population and a lot of dependencies, but, um, but Spain was in incredible internal and external indebtedness. Um, so that its actual productive elements in that society uh, were not grand compared with the amount of internal productive work which is going on up north in the Dutch Republic and the United Provinces. So coming to your uh, observation about the size of the American GDP, the gross domestic product, and pulling it aside to ask, well, what component of our economic activity and our economic spending focuses around the supply of the medical needs of the 330 million Americans? And oh my word, isn't it a case, again, look at the comparative statistics of the World Health Organization or of the Weekly Economist, isn't it weird that we spend four times as much per capita on our overall health costs and yet our outcomes are four times as much as, say, Denmark, and yet our uh, outcomes in terms of health product are not really so good. What is going on here? What is going on in a in a in a, a country in which the costs of getting a particular procedure, especially a, a technical one, a demanding one, coming and the cost to the insurance company seem to be so high, Pat, that if you wanted to explore this, you and your husband could go off and get that particular medical procedure at a clinic in Copenhagen or somewhere like that for a, a third of the cost with equally professional medical staff and hospital and have a holiday to boot and not have spent as much. What is going on here? So uh, I'm not going to try and go further in this issue of exploring the healthcare costs challenge in American society, except to say that your society could look uh, very large in terms of relative GDP, but it might well be that what you're doing in spending the wealth internally, showing your uh, historical uh, you know, preferences is 
is inefficient and is not adding really to significant national strength. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Professor Kennedy. It looks like we have one last question in the chat, and it comes from uh, Gary Klinger. He says that the U.S. has Yale and other institutions which provide world-leading educated individuals. Is this uh, the ultimate world power attribute? How important are world-class institutions such as Yale, when, in which the U.S. predominates, in determining world power emergence and staying power? That's a good question. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure the president of Yale and the provost would be delighted at your description of, of Yale as one of the leaders in the world-class uh, uh, educational institutions. But you put your finger on something that uh, maybe is a phenomenon of the past hundred years, but not before then. The emergence of a small number of research universities in the Western world who attracted a significant string of young foreign students, not scholars, but students, people usually coming to do the undergraduate degree at places like Oxford and Harvard and Yale, coming from China, coming from certain Latin American countries, often themselves the children of middle class professionals who knew the value of getting an education at one of the top, top institutions. And many of them then going back to uh, their own country where they become over time a national leader. Not all of them do. And many national leaders actually arise in, in reaction against the foreign influence and the foreign educated. But I have to say that I would often find in the privilege of a Yale professor or having an Oxford degree that I would you know, go to some meeting of United Nations ambassadors or go off in my time to be a Sherpa at the World Economic Conference, a Congress in, uh, in uh, Davos and have a large number of senior businessmen or diplomats come along to me and say, oh, you know, I didn't go to Yale, I went to the other place, meaning Harvard, or I, I was working at Yale under Gaddis Smith 25 years ago, and they would feel very proud of that. So there, there isn't, you, you do get an advantage of, um, you do get an advantage of uh, being a premier intellectual institution worldwide. Uh, which many other countries do not have because they don't have an equivalent. It's very hard to see one going to Germany or Spain and, at the moment, or Tokyo even, and getting that equivalence. Thank you, Professor Kennedy. It, lo it looks like that concludes um, the questions from the audience. So I'd like to turn it over to Jesus, but first I, just wanted to say thank you again uh, to the audience for attending. And of course, thank you to Professor Kennedy for your time and for the wonderful explanations and responses to all of the questions. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Jesus. All right, Declan, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Um, well, Professor Kennedy, um, thank you so much for the fascinating conversation. <laughs> it's really been a privilege to host you and to learn from you this afternoon. And uh, we very much look forward to the second edition of the Rise and Fall of the Great Powers. And we would love to have you back anytime. It is and thank you and thanks to all who looked in. Thanks to all of those who didn't get a chance to chat but wanted to chat. Um, I'm so grateful to you for your uh, interest in these subjects and for your interest in Yale. And thank you all for inviting me. And again, Marika, thank you for setting this up so well. I, I share your sentiment. I also like to thank Declan Kunkel, our, our incredible host. And I'd like to take this opportunity to reiterate our deep appreciation to Bob Bonds at YAA for his help in arranging this presentation.
Mm -hmm. Bob, as you know, the Yale Club of Fort Worth owes you so much. Um, and to everyone, thank you for tuning in. As a reminder, the Yale Club of Fort Worth will hold its annual meeting on October 6, and we hope that you enjoyed this event as much as we have. We thank you for your support and always appreciate your ideas and um, for any programs that uh, you can think of that will serve the Yale and North Texas communities. Have a great afternoon. And Professor Kennedy, again, thank you so much. It was incredible thank to have you with us. Enjoy the rest thank of you. the day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.